All right, good evening everyone. Welcome to uh, Wednesday Night Bible Devotions. Good to uh, be with you tonight and I uh, hope and pray that you've had a great day and uh, that you're looking forward to uh, time in the Word and excited about what uh, the Lord has for us as always tonight. So uh, um, yeah, so let's get into it, shall we? Let's go to, uh, let's go to uh, 2 Timothy chapter 1, 2 Timothy chapter 1. Um, I have, uh, Trace, good evening. I have been uh, in pastoral ministry now uh, probably since the late 90s as an associate or assistant associate pastor and, um, and then, of course, what they call senior pastor later on. Uh, and so I've been, uh, I've, I've, been, I've been in pastoral ministry for a little while now. I've been preaching for a little while. And one of the most... Uh, asked questions or struggles that that I've come across or that God's people have come to me with uh, really twofold but they're one. Hey Pond family good evening. I've had so many people come to me over the years asking me what what how do I find the will of God? How do I find the will? What is the will of God for my life? How do I find that? And they're sincere and they're very sincere and 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 you know, I'm never wanting to be dismissive. I know some God, oh, well, you know, God's word is his will and his will is his word. And, and that's true. And that's very true. And we'll look a little bit about that. But but there are some people that, uh, Uncle, good evening. Um, there are some people out there that uh, really struggle and want to know, want to know what the will of God is for their life. And the other one is purpose. I've had a number of folks over the years ask me, I, I just don't know what God's purpose is for my life. What is God's purpose? Can you pray for me that I would know what God's purpose is for my life? And again, a legitimate question. Uh, wonderful to know that God's people are, um, are striving to, to know what that is. And um, so they're, they're probably, they're, they've had other questions, obviously, over the years, but th- those are ones, Robert and Rachel, good evening, those, those are ones that, that really a lot of Christians want to know. I want to know the will of God for my life, and I want to know what God's purpose is. And, and when you talk about the will and purpose, they really connect together. And so I want to talk to you tonight on this thought, Brother Clive, good evening. Uh, God's will and purpose, God's will and purpose. Um, you know, when you think about when you when you think about the the will of God, we'll read some scripture in a minute. When I think about the will of God, you've often heard of uh, God's perfect will and His permissive will. Um, Sue Ellen, good evening. Uh, and I know what they mean by that, to, but to be honest with you, I, um, I I don't know all. I, I tell you what I see in the Bible: God's will. You're either in God's will, or you're not in God's will. Uh, this permissive will stuff, I, I, you know, like it's like, well, you know, it's not God's perfect will, but it's his permissive. He's, he's letting you do this. Um, Romans chapter 12 and verse number two tells us not to be conformed to this will, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Just good evening. So when you look at Romans 12 too, there's good, acceptable and perfect will of God. Let me just say this. God, God wants you to know what his perfect will is and what his purpose is for your life. And it's not difficult. It really is not difficult. Satan would have you believe that it's very hard to know what the will of God is for your life and what God's purpose is for you. You know, you could go to scriptures there in 2 Thessalonians chapter 5 and everything, give thanks for this is the will of God concerning you in Christ Jesus. So we know that the will of God is for us to give thanks, right? So there are in the scriptures the very basic principles of the will of God. Gene, good evening. And there's basic ideas of the purpose that God has for you in the scripture. But I also believe that there is a specific will and purpose that God has, and I believe this for each and every one of us. It's that specific, if you please, that specific will, that specific purpose that that we struggle with knowing what it is. Uh, Can I share a little testimony with you? It was in 2005, during a time of prayer and fasting, that God actually revealed to me in a number of different ways, through his word, through a pastor friend, and so on and so forth. 
what his will and calling on my life is. Because I do believe, I do believe in a calling. Um, I know some preachers don't, but I, I specifically, but I know, and I know that because I've experienced that. But I don't know it just because I've experienced it. I actually believe it's it's biblical for God to give a specific call. There's the call to salvation. Okay, so if you're saved, you've you've He's called you by His gospel. Um, there is the call to be with Him. You know, before He sent those disciples out, He called them unto Himself. The first thing when we think about our calling is that we're called to himself. We're called to be with him. But then there's the other calling that he may give you, a call to a specific ministry, a call to service for him within the church. So let's go to 2 Timothy chapter 1 and let's have a look at some scripture here. He says in verse 8, Be not thou therefore ashamed of the testimony of our Lord, nor of me his prisoner, but be thou partaker of the afflictions of the gospel according to the power of God. You know, let me just say this. You're able to handle the afflictions of the gospel. When you say afflictions of the gospel, those who share their faith, those who want to live for Jesus, those who those who are who are wanting to follow God's will and purpose for their life, they will face affliction. But we face that according to the power of God, right? Another topic altogether. Verse 9, who, God, hath saved us and called us with a holy calling. Now, there's that calling. So he saved us, but then he's, then he's placed a holy calling. Anything that God calls you to do for himself, it's holy. All right, it's holy. Why? Because it's from him. So that call under himself, when he calls you to be with him, that's a holy calling. Uh, when he calls you to Sasha, good evening. When he calls you to be a, a a mother, a wife, a husband, a father. When he calls you to be uh, a Sunday school teacher, a, a a discipler, brother Michael Newby. Good evening. When he calls you to a uh, to when he calls you to be a pastor, or he calls you to be a preacher, or whatever it is, it's a holy calling because it's from God. Your call to be a mother or your call to be a father or a husband or a wife, that's a holy calling. And one that shouldn't be taken lightly and, and a calling that you shouldn't allow others to put down. The world wants to put that down, but don't let the world put that down. The devil wants to put that down. I believe in a call to ministry. It's a holy calling. I, I remember where I was when God called me. No, it wasn't midnight, it wasn't verbal, it wasn't, you know, like, oh, you know, I had this great flash of lightning from, but it was a calling nonetheless. I, I knew without a shadow of a doubt what God had called me to do. The first thing for me is he called me to preach. I know that without a shadow of a doubt. Where he places a man that's called to preach is up to God as far as being a pastor or an evangelist or a, or a missionary. That's how You will use that initial calling to preach in one of those three areas if you're, if you're a man. You know, if if uh, if God calls a man into ministry and that man is uh, is married, then that calling on that wife's life is to follow her man in that high calling. You know, when God called Abram out of Ur of the Chaldees, He called Abram. He didn't he, he didn't say, "Oh, Abram and Sarai, come here." No, He called Abram to go out, and Sarai followed her husband by faith. So in a sense, when you think, think about Sarai, that was a holy calling to follow her husband. Never think that following your husband in ministry or so on. So that's a holy calling. Don't think light of that. And, uh, you know, whatever, whatever that calling is that God places, you say, well, I don't know if he's called me to that. Listen, hear him carefully. Listen. You know, when Samuel was a little baby, do you remember that in 1 Samuel chapter 3? I think it was chapter 2 or 3. Um, you know, he's gone there to Eli. And he's lying down at night and he says, Samuel, Samuel. And he gets up and he runs to Eli and says, what do you want? He said, Eli, go to bed. It wasn't me. And he did that another time. And the third time, Eli finally cottoned on and said, oh, that's God. And he said, next time you hear that, say, speak, Lord, for thy servant here. And the call that happened again. And God had called a, a young boy. Now, check that, a young boy into ministry. He's called him to be a prophet <laughs> at a young age. You know what I mean? I've known plenty of guys that have said that not long after they got saved, they, they sensed that call to follow God in ministry. So it's a holy calling, all right? Not according to our works. So the calling that he places 
is not according to our works, not according to what we do, but according to his own purpose and grace, which was given us in Christ Jesus before the world began, but is now made manifest by the appearing of our Saviour, Jesus Christ. What's he saying there? This, this will be, I hope this will be of a help to you because when you think, and notice something very carefully here, it's his purpose, not yours, in a sense. He's called, it's his purpose. Sometimes we think, oh man, I want to do this, I want to do that. You know, I was thinking the other day, I, I really wanted to be a policeman. <laughs> I think I would have made a good cop. Uh, you know, I really wanted to be a policeman. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I, I actually, yeah, I wanted, no, let me go back. First, I wanted to join the army. And then God said no. And then I thought, okay, I'll be a policeman. I want to be a policeman. My next door neighbor was a policeman. He was a bike cop and all of that. And that looked really cool. And, you know, I was like, well, that'd be a, that'd be a good, uh, good, good, you know, good job, uh, be a policeman. Well, you know, I went through a number there and colorblind, I'm colorblind, so I can't be a policeman and so on and so forth. And, oh, this is what I'm doing. I'm going to do this. And God said, every time I wanted to fulfill my purpose, God put a, 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 door, a wall there said, no, no, no. And it was like, I don't want you to go there. I don't want you to go there. I don't want you to go there. And it's like, well, okay, well, I just like felt like I floated around for a long time. But God knows what's best. And he was channeling me. And this is what he'll do, folks. He'll channel you to get you to where he wants you to be. And he'll put roadblocks. He'll put, he'll put things in your way to stop you and say, okay, I'm going to go this way. And you go down that way for a little bit. And I said, no, nope, turn it. And I'll go here, go there. So that's what God did for me. I was saying he's going to do it for you. But that's what he did for me. But notice something about this. this it's, his, it's his purpose and grace, which was given us in Christ Jesus. But is now made manifest by the appearing of our Savior. If you want to know what the will and purpose of God for your life is, it's found in Christ Jesus. There you go. It's found in Christ Jesus. It, it, it was manifest by the appearing. So we want to be like Christ. So God's will and purpose for you is to look at Jesus, and when you look at Jesus, you know that's what God wants me to do. That's what God wants me to be. That's his purpose for my life. That's amazing to me. This is why I'm always saying study the life of Christ. You can't go wrong in studying the life of Christ. Brother Martin, good evening. So your will, the, God's will and purpose for you and for me is found in Christ. Right. Notice something in Romans chapter eight, Romans chapter eight, because I, I, I real, I'm really big on this in the sense that it's his purpose. Judy, good evening. And that's why I made a statement the other day that you can't serve God on your terms. If you want to serve God on your terms, you probably won't end up serving him. Uh, and what I mean by serving God on your terms I'm talking about do, just doing what you want to do. Oh man, you know, I, 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 I want, you know, I, I want the, uh, I don't know. I want to play in the, in the orchestra. I want to play in the band. Jack, good evening. Or I want to, I want to do this and I want to do that. No, oh, you know, I don't want to get my hands dirty. I don't want to go and I don't want to, I don't want to have a, uh, I, I don't want to involve in a ministry where I've got to go to down and outers and. Feed, but I don't, I don't want to do that. No, that's just not me. This is, this is what, no, you know what that is? That's, that's trying to serve God on your own terms. God first called you unto himself. He's shown his will and purpose for your life in Christ Jesus. What did Jesus do? Jesus ministered to every, per, everybody, whether they were rich or poor. Uh, whether they were uh, male or female, whether they were a prostitute or not. Jesus Jesus knew the hearts of all men. We know that. But I tell you, I love this verse where it says, the common man heard Jesus gladly. So sometimes as we study Christ and in Christ we see our will and our purpose, Jesus knew what it was to get, can I put it this way, down and dirty. He knew what it was to get down into you know, to the level of every individual. He touched the leper. That was a no-no. Touched the leper, did things that the Pharisees tried to call him out on all sorts, all right? 
So it's his purpose. Notice something in Romans 8, 28. We know it so well. We know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to his purpose. When he called you, he called you for his purpose. (laughs) That's why we're bought with a price. We're not our own. We are somebody else's purchase and that somebody else is God. So when he called you, he called you for his purpose. He had he had something specific in mind for you. Yes, we see our will and purpose in the life of Christ, but he has something specific and he and he's had that specific before the foundation of the earth. He's got that specific will and that specific purpose for your life. But he's called you under his purpose. Because it says, for whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his son. So when God called you for his purpose, his purpose is for you to be conformed to the image of his son, to be like Jesus in this earth, on this earth, now. right? We're to be like Christ now. He is our example. We minister to people. We help people. We preach the gospel. We do everything that we see Jesus doing, we do. We do. We pray for the sick. We try and help where we can and so on and so forth. All right. Now, when you think about, when you think about, um, when you think about the will and purpose for your life, there is a preparation time for that, preparation for the purpose. And with that thought in mind, I want to go to the book of Acts chapter 7 and I want to look at a, a spiritual example, a scriptural, sorry, a scriptural example. And that scriptural example is Moses. Moses, what a man of God. I mean, you know, I look, you know, you think about they're all great men and women of God. We get that. But Moses, oh, Moses. You think about Moses for a moment. And uh, something very interesting about Moses' life, you know, we know that he started out as a babe and what Pharaoh was doing and Jochebed put him into that ark and, um, you know, probably got the idea from Noah. Uh, You know, there's three arks that were built. There was the Ark of the Covenant, there was the Ark that Noah built, and there was the Ark that uh, Jochebed made for Moses. Pitched it within, pitched it without, right? So it was safe. He was safe in the ark and put him out on that Nile River, which, by the way, had some pretty big crocodiles in it, right? That was where they threw all those kids to be killed. So we know the story. Pharaoh's daughter finds him, brings him into Pharaoh's house and is raised in Pharaoh's courts. I want you to think about this when 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 Moses was right now when you th- Moses was someone okay let's have a look at some scripture verse 17 uh, verse 20 let's go to verse 20 Acts chapter 7 verse 20 uh, it says this in which time Moses was born and was exceeding fair there was something about Moses that his parents saw in him he's described three different ways in 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 Exodus chapter 2 and 3 and in Hebrews chapter 11 and here, and they're all meaning the same thing. There was something about Moses that Jochebed saw in him. And by the way, folks, let me just say this. I hope you as parents see something special in your children. You know, this is why Satan is fighting hard for the young generation. And I hope and pray you see something special in your children. So Moses was born, was exceeding fair and nourished up in his father's house three months. And when he was cast out, Pharaoh's daughter took him up and nourished him for her own son. And Moses, now check this out. Moses was learned in all the wisdom of the Egyptians and was mighty in words and in deeds. Moses was no dummy. Moses was an intellectual. Moses was was schooled in all of the way of the Egyptians. You know, even today, people look back at, at what was built by the Egyptians and they marvel. Do you know that Moses was privy to those things? Moses was educated in all those things. He was not only schooled in the way of Egyptian, he was, he was a statesman. Notice what it says. He was mighty in words. He was a statesman. And he was a soldier, if you please, mighty in words and in deeds. I mean, Moses was not a wimpy character. 
You remember when he, uh, when he fled Egypt and he was on the backside of the desert there and waiting by that well and he, he, uh, he, uh, he protected the ladies from those other shepherds. He drove those other shepherds off. I tell you, there must have been something about Moses. Moses was schooled in the way of the Egyptians. He was a statesman, as mighty in words, and he was a soldier. He was a mighty man, not to be messed with, right? Notice what it says in verse 23. And when he was full 40 years old, it came into his heart to visit his brethren, the children of Israel. And seeing one of them suffer wrong, he defended him and avenged him that was oppressed and smote the Egyptian. For he supposed his brethren would have understood how that God by his hand would deliver them, but they understood not. What was it that came into his heart? It, what it is, was God's will and purpose for Moses. God put it into his heart at the age of 40 because he said he supposed his brethren would have understood how that God by his hand would deliver them. God put his will and purpose for Moses to deliver his people into his heart. And when it comes to your life, if you're struggling, I, God, I want to know what your will is. I want to know what your purpose is for my life. God will put it into your heart. You say, why did Moses, Gina, good evening. Why did God put it into the heart of Moses at the age of 40? Why didn't he wait until he was 80? Because he needed to redo and re-educate Moses and he needed to prepare him for God's purpose. Do you know what Moses did? Now, oftentimes Moses gets the rough end of the stick when he killed that Egyptian. Okay, But what Moses did for God, he did by faith because it had come into his heart. The, the will and purpose of God to deliver his people had been placed into his heart and so he believed that he was just following that calling on his life straight away. So what, what, what happened? What, how would you feel if your faith led to failure? Now, not in the eyes of God, but probably in your own eyes, you would think, I've failed. I've failed. Why? It's, it's like that God set him up for a failure. Why didn't God use Moses at the age of 40? I'll tell you why I believe God didn't use Moses at the age of 40. Because at the age of 40... Moses, as I said, was schooled in all the ways of the Egyptians. He was a statesman. He was a soldier. He was a mighty man. And if, if Moses uh, fulfilled and did what he did at the age of 40, people would have looked at that and said, well, that's what we expect from someone who's a 40 years old and, and who's been educated. Like We would expect that from you. But if you notice what God did for Moses in preparing him for the, the, the great will and purpose and calling for his life, he took him to the backside of the desert for 40 years. He was in the backside of the desert, learning or relearning, re-educating. He had to get he had to get. Egypt out of him, if you please. He had to get all of those things out of him to the point now. Notice when, he, when it was said here in Acts that he was mighty in words to the very point that when God called him in Exodus chapter 3, remember the burning bush? It says here later on, the burning bush. What was it that Moses said to God? I'm unable. I can't do it. I, I'm slow of speech. And he listed all these excuses. God had to take Moses from his own abilities, if you please, strip him of his own abilities, get him to the point of, I can't do this. And when you get to the point of, I can't do this, God says, right, I can now use you so that I get the glory. Notice what the Bible says in, in 1 Corinthians. Go with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 1 for a minute. 1 Corinthians chapter 1. You know, when God thinks about things, he does think it a little bit differently than what we do. We, you know, man, I, me, I would have used Moses at 40, wouldn't you? 
I mean, he's in his prime. I mean, he's, he, he's, he's fit, he, he's schooled, he's educated. He knows all about the Egyptians and knows about all of those mighty in words and deeds. Man, that's a guy. That's the guy that we ought to use. But Moses would have received the accolades, not God. Notice what it says here in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 26. For you see your calling, brethren, how that not many wise men after the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble are called. There's some, but not many. Bronwyn, good evening. Verse 27. But God hath chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise, and God hath chosen the weak things of the world to confound the things which are mighty, and base things of the world, and things which are despised hath God chosen, yea, and things which are not to bring to naught the things that are. God had to bring Moses to the place of things which are not. He had to get him to the place of are not. I, I'm, I am not able to do this. I, I am slow of speech. I stutter. I can't do this. Blah, blah, off he went. After 40 years, he went from being mighty in words and deeds to I can't do this. God says, now I will release you for the will and purpose that I have for you. So he sent him to the wilderness. Do you know the wilderness is not a wasted time for anybody? I used to think that. I had my wilderness experience, and maybe you have too. My teenage years, I would say, was a wilderness experience. And, um, you know, in the wilderness, it's dry. In the wilderness, it's barren. But I want you to think with me for a moment. The people that God called out of the wilderness, that God placed in the wilderness and then called them out of the wilderness. Elijah. Amos, John the Baptist, Jesus, before he did preached any messages, before he did any miracles, he was led of the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted for 40 days and 40 nights, and he came out in the power of the Spirit, and bang, off he went, the Apostle Paul. The first thing that Paul did when he, Paul got saved, God sent him to the wilderness, and that was the place where God gets his people prepared for his purpose. That's where you understand that you have been created by God for something special. And I believe that. I believe that in every child of God, God has something special for them to do. And I don't care how old you are. I don't care whether you're 50, 60, 70, 80, any advances on 80, or whether you're 40, 30, 20, whatever. God has that perfect will. God has that will. God has the basic wills for us that we find in the scripture. But there is a, a will and a purpose that we have in Christ. There is a will and a purpose that he has for you. And just like Moses, he deposited into his heart. It came into his heart. But the timing, the timing is of the essence. God's perfect timing. I heard this during the week. A preacher said this. If you want to know the timing of God, you must spend time with God. Oh, look, it, you know, every, was, every one of us, I would say, struggles with knowing God's timing for things. All you got to do is spend time with God. I found that, I found that an eye-opener. But when we talk about God's will and purpose, brethren, let me just say this. It's, it's not difficult for you to know what the will and purpose of God is for your life. It's found in Christ. It's found in Christ and it's placed in your heart. But God will prepare you when he's ready to release you, when he's ready to get you to a place where whatever, there's that preparation time. He will strip away all of your abilities, all of your might, all of your, because he delights in weakness, not in a narcissistic way. But like Paul said, the apostle, when I am weak, then I'm strong. Why? because of the strength of God in our life. Don't panic. You will not miss 
the will of God and the purpose of God for your life. I don't believe you'll miss it. Just stay being faithful to him and God will reveal it to you when he's ready. Let's pray. Father, we love you. We thank you for your goodness and blessing to us. Lord, we thank you for the lives of these ones in the Bible. We thank you for our Saviour through who we look at and see that example of purpose and grace, your will. So I pray, God, that you would help us with that in our life. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, God bless you. Thanks for joining tonight. I appreciate that. Have a good rest of your evening. Have a good day tomorrow, and I'll see you same time tomorrow night. Until then, God bless, and goodbye for now.